So hello, everybody. Welcome to Organ Technology Part 23. Today, we're going to be taking a tour of a Rogers 340 theater organ. Now, the particular 340 in question, I have an interesting connection to, and I discovered this by surprise and delight. So back in the day, I discovered the organ at a place called Pizza and Pipes. It was one of the many pizza parlors with an old theater organ in it for entertainment and uh, those were very popular back in the 70s and so I got enamored with the organ wanted to learn to play so I started hunting around at the various music stores to see what kind of organs were available and of course back in those days the little home organs the spinet models with the little shorty keyboards and the tiny 13 note pedal board and the you know easy play features and all of that those were extremely popular so my little town of Fresno had five stores that sold these things. But as I was riding my bike around town and looking at different things, all I was seeing was these little rinky-dink home organs. And I wanted to be a serious organist, so I wanted a serious organ. Had lofty ideas back then. At any rate, uh, I ended up at the local Rogers dealer. Now that store also had the you know usual uh, fare, but they had also they sold Rogers, which were professional organs. And on display in that store was this beautiful model 340 in black. It was absolutely gorgeous. Well, you know, I had been taking piano lessons for many years at this point, so I asked, "Hey, can I try this out?" And the guy there, who would later become a friend of mine, uh, said, sure. And so I got up there and tinkered around with a little bit. And it, it looked like the organ at the pizza parlor, and it sounded like the organ at the pizza parlor. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a, a really amazing thing. I, I would really like to have this. So I don't remember exactly what a Rogers 340 cost in 1977. I know I asked and uh, my jaw dropped when I heard the price. I have heard from some and various uh, sources that the retail price was something like fifty thousand dollars back in 1977 and that seems rather extraordinary to me uh, given that the year before my parents bought their house for eight thousand dollars. So at uh, any rate, obviously, I wasn't going to be putting that on my Christmas list. So as things progressed, I found a economical instrument. My grandfather helped me buy that, and uh, I was off uh, to the races. But, of course, that black 340 was always something I was like, oh, boy, I wish I had one of those. A couple years into my organ playing, I started taking wedding jobs. And one of the first weddings I played at was at a Baptist church here in town. And lo and behold, that black 340 was the organ I got to play. After that, I lost track of it. Eventually, the church was remodeled. They got a different organ. I never really knew what happened to the old 340. I assumed it ended up, you know, um, somewhere in a residence. So just earlier, just a few months ago, a uh, person from Southern California contacted me uh, through my website and said, hey, I have a Rogers 340. Uh, I'd like to get rid of it. Are you interested? Uh, we worked out a deal and uh, it ended up that he actually delivered it uh, to me. I have a warehouse uh, with some piano movers and we have kind of an agreement where I can stage equipment through there as long as they get to handle the move. And so I'm giving them business, and they give me a little space from time to time. So we got it there, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, black 340. There weren't that many 340s made in the first place. And I doubt that all that many of them would have been done in black, because most of them would have been the antique white, which was very popular, or just dark walnut. And uh, so I thought, God, could that be the 340 from my earlier days, from 40 plus years ago? So I started examining the instrument, took the back off, opened it up, and inside were notes 
from a guy named Joe Cardoza. Now, Joe Cardoza was a local organ technician here in Fresno, and any time he did an unusual repair or some kind of modification, he put a detailed note right next to where that had taken place. Well, that means that there's a 99 and 9 tenths percent chance that that is the black 340 that I played when I was a kid. So the full history on this, it was on display at the music store. It went to the church that bought it. From there, it went to a radio station in Southern California. And from there, it went to the gentleman who sold it to me. So... Naturally, when I got this thing and figured out it was the 340, I thought, you know, that's there's so much sentimentality there, maybe I should keep this one. Well, the truth is that my little studio, I've had to clear things out because it's just, it's a small room, it's not that big, and I just can't house really, really big organ consoles and have, you know, like space for people to hang out and have drinks while I play music. So I've, you know, decided to skinny things down and I just felt, you know, okay, this is nice. I'm getting to visit it once more. Now, my original plan was to gut this organ and turn it into a Hopper controller. And when I posted that idea, just to see how much interest there would be in such a thing, man, did I get kickback from the internet. People were very unhappy about that idea. So I said, okay, I'll see if it can be fixed up. Lo and behold, it only needed some minor repairs. And so I went ahead and just fixed it up. And then I put it out there. Here it is. Does somebody want to buy it? And a friend of mine here locally happened to be looking for a 340. He has the studio space for it. And uh, he and I worked out a deal, and we'll take a, a look at some of that. So right now, let's take a little tour of this Rogers 340. We're going to look inside and see just what goes into making this particular instrument. Now here we see the first rack. And on the first rack are uh, two sets of oscillators, the Vox and the main oscillators. There's the trumpet, the canura, and the post horn, and the Vox and the diapason keyers. And all of these 340s were somewhat custom. So when you open up a 340, you don't necessarily see the same things on each of the racks. And so when I looked up the service manual information and looked up the uh, rack layouts, it just didn't give you anything. It just said on the first rack is, you know, the, you know these uh, circuit boards and uh, or it might be this, you know, and there were lots and lots of options uh, on the 340. So if we take a closer look at this, here are the two sets of oscillators that are on the first rack on the 340. The top in the two top bays is oscillators that are just for the Vox Humana. And then the set down below are the main oscillators and that covers a, a number of voices. If we move over a bit, now we see the Vox filter circuits. It looks like a bank of more oscillators laid out differently. Rogers used a the same field coil design both for the oscillator control and for uh, the filter voicing. The difference is that in most cases, of course, the oscillator uh, coils, and those are those ceramic cylinder looking things, uh, the field coils on the oscillators are variable so that you can tune the oscillator. On filter circuits, it depends. Sometimes they're variable in terms of giving you uh, a tonal variation in the filter circuit, or sometimes they're fixed where turning them is not going to do anything except possibly damage the, <laughs> the coil. 
Um, but right away we see that a lot of effort is being put into uh, having a Vox Humana as part of the 340's specification. The next pic so in the next photo we see the output board and the trumpet keyer. Now the output board is where we adjust the output level of all of the various voices in the organ. This is where we do our basic voicing of the instrument. Uh, essentially the audio output from all of the keyer filter circuits comes into this board and this is where we control everything to level it all out and that gives us all of our uh, control over the instrument so it sounds right in the space it happens to be in. So in the next picture uh, we're looking on the lower right hand side of the first rack. The top left there is the Vox Keyer. So the Vox Humana has its own oscillators, its own individual per note filters, and its own keyer. So like I say, a lot of effort went into creating a Vox Humana for this instrument. That might explain why the more modestly priced 327 and 333 did not have a Vox Humana because the circuit they would want to use is obviously taking up a lot of space and a lot of additional money. So they probably had to omit that to you know, meet that price point. Over on the right, we see the keyer for the Kenura and the post horn. And the bottom left in two narrow bays is the keyer for the diapason. Now, if we open that up and we look at the second rack, here's where we see the tibia oscillators. Now, this is interesting because on the 340, the tibia oscillators are not just for the tibia. If we go back to the 33E, which was built in the 1960s, there was a bank of oscillators that were just the tibia. And that's the way it is in my 33E. And that's wired up just like a unit rank of pipes on a pipe organ. You have switching circuits that route at the different pitches onto that bank of oscillators, the same way you would unify a rank of pipes by connecting the keyboard to different pitch ranges within that rank of pipes. The same thing was done. In this case, it's still called the tibia oscillators, but now we're looking at it doing several voices that are represented on this rack. Now, if we look over at a closer picture on the top, those are the trap uh, circuits that generates like the snare drum, cymbal, wood block, bass drum, that kind of thing. And those are a variety of oscillators and filters uh, that are worked from the, con the, the console. The lower bays uh, where we see all those induction coils with the ceramic cylinders, those are the tibia oscillators. And the next picture we see on the left, this is the tremulant generator. And we're doing the same thing that was done on earlier Rogers instruments where we have a light bulb controlling a variable resistor uh, to get a tremolent effect and then another circuit that's synchronized with that to get a vibrato effect by biasing the oscillators. In other words, the tuning of the oscillators is rapidly being changed a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit up, a little bit down. And then the combination of that vibrato by changing the pitch of the oscillators combined with the synchronized tremolo, tremolo which is changing the amplitude loud and soft at the same time is what creates the characteristic tremulant effect that you would hear on the heavy tremulants of a, of a theater pipe organ. Over to the right, that's the keyer for the tibia. And like I said, on earlier models like the 33E, the tibia was just the oscillators being turned on and off. In this case, we have the oscillators uh, going into a keyer circuit where we gate the signal. I've explained that in earlier videos. And uh, that's just a different way to approach the same problem. Uh, this allows for several other stops to be pulled off of that same bank of oscillators. 
So we have um, on the next photo, we have on the far left a narrow panel. We have that's the harp keyer to give the marimba effect. And then we see uh, two sets of keyers that each is on the left the string and then on the right the clarinet and those are in two sections and then along the bottom we have the keyer for the chrysoglot if we go into the third rack most of what you see here are the stop switches and these are very similar to the stop switches that are used on a unit pipe organ uh, they are a diode gate circuit that sends the 12 volt keying signal to different keyers, uh, in this case, uh, in the organ. In a pipe organ, it would be sending that 12 volt signal out to different pipe ranks. You also see uh, on the lower left there, the string celeste oscillators. This is the second string that is purposely tuned sharp to give you that uh, lovely celeste effect. Then if we zoom in a little closer, we can take a closer look at the string oscillators. Uh, and then there's also the extension of those over on the lower right. On the top, it, we see the 32 foot oscillators. Uh, this is an, an add on thing and, but okay, where's the keyer? That's, that's interesting and that's coming up. The next picture shows the chimes. This is a chime system that is often used on pipe organs. Uh, it's basically an amplified clock chime that you might see in a really like a grandfather clock. And in this case, we have them tuned to uh, musical pitches. And then, of course, over on the right, you see the power supply. The power supply had some staining on it that indicated that the diode, the, main, the diodes of the main uh, rectifier circuit had burned up. And they surely must have been replaced, but then the tech didn't clean up all of that smoke damage, so I wasn't absolutely certain about the condition of those diodes. And when we first turned the organ on, there were some noises and things going on that... I thought maybe there's a problem here. I went ahead and replaced the rectifier oscillators. Uh, the schematic calls for six amp oscillator or diodes. Sorry about that. The rectifier diodes. The diodes um, that are called for in the schematic are six amp diodes, and the diodes that were in this setup, which were undoubtedly replacement diodes did not appear to be big enough to be six amp diodes. So I went ahead and replaced them. And I did find when testing the diodes that were removed that one of them was leaking. So that would explain why the power supply wasn't completely keen, uh, clean. So now we open up that final third rack and we look in underneath the keyboards. This is the keyer for the 32 foot Borden. And the way it's mounted and, and kind of wedged in there, it almost looks like it's a homemade add-on. It's not. Uh, this was the normal procedure. If you just look at how tightly packed all of those racks were, this was kind of the only place you could put that keyer for the 32-foot Borden. And uh, so that's just a, an interesting way that they went ahead and solved the problem. And this is a picture of the 340 in its new home at my friend's house. We obviously are just getting things set up and speakers connected. and uh, But it is playing and we're just kind of sorting out the details of how it's going to be installed in the studio. So this has been a fascinating and fun project for me. And there's more to come. Um, obviously the next thing we have to do is work out how we're, which speakers, there's different speakers we've been experimenting with, Rogers M10, some Walker speakers that were designed for Rogers analog instruments. And we're trying to figure out the subwoofer situation because there's limited space and we want something that'll, you know, really put out some oomph, but not take up half the room. 
And uh, so little details like that. And that's coming up in the upcoming weeks. We probably will do some voicing work on this instrument. And there may be some additional minor repairs that come up as the organ gets played. So all of that will be coming up in future videos where we'll be talking more about this lovely old 340. Thanks for joining me today. Hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you next time.